I have it set to automatic. Hello, welcome. Hi. Hello, everybody. So you're going to want to have um, a hair tie, a shirt that allows you access to We can't hear you. There we go. <gasps> Oopsie, was I just talking that whole time on mute? Oh my goodness. Hi everyone. <laughs> Round I think two. they muted you. <laughs> Along and, with um, the rest of us. Elizabeth, if you want to uh, start recording, okay. we can do that now. <laughs> Ooh, we're recording so, and you're unmuted, so we're good. <laughs> Welcome everyone. I'm so happy you're here. So you're going to want to have a hair tie, a shirt that allows you access to a little bit of neck and shoulders because we always start with the neck. Um, I like to have a hand towel to wipe off any excess oils um, when I'm doing this like away from my bathroom and a glass of water is always great to have as well. So and of course your gua sha stone. So if you need any of those items and don't have them, you can go ahead and fetch them before we dive into all the goodness. Okay. So today we're going to be going over um, like 101. This is to get you started. If this is your um, intro to Gua Sha, intro to the Wildling Empress ritual, um, Gua Sha can be, you know, sometimes a little bit daunting to get started with if you've never done anything like this before. Um, there is some technique involved, but once you've got it, once you've got that sort of learning curve covered, you have a technique that you can literally do for the rest of your life. And that is so, so amazing to me. Um, you can care for your own skin in a way that is self-loving and effective and doesn't require going for treatments all the time, especially in the age of staying home. This is just so incredibly valuable. And it's also a great compliment if you do like getting treatments and you're in a place where that is um, available and safe. Um, in my practice in New York, I also realized I should introduce myself, but um, a lot of my clients would be doing their own home care in between their professional facial gua sha sessions. And it only made our sessions that much more effective because they were able to work out stagnation and tension on a regular basis. So we could go even deeper when we were in session together. So I'm Britta Plug. I am one of the co-founders of Wildling. I've been an esthetician for over 17 years. And it's not a stretch to say that this practice um, changed my career and changed my life. I fell in love with it from the get-go because it is so holistic, effective, and affects us on many levels, like the relaxation, the tissue rejuvenation. Um, and I just love so much working more than skin deep. As an esthetician for many years, everything was just very, very surface, all about whatever products you were putting on your skin, getting into the deeper layers of tissue, um, the muscles, the fascia, working with the lymphatic system, all of these things help to nourish the skin. They're the foundation upon which the skin is sitting. So it's going deeper. 
now I will not be monitoring the chat box throughout this because I get very, very easily distracted. And I will check at the end. Um, we have one of our team members, Elizabeth, on here with us this evening, who will be answering questions in the chat if necessary. But again, I'll be um, doing a little Q&A portion at the end. We'll probably be on here for about an hour. And we're going to chat a little bit about washa first. And then we'll get into the practice and go through the full Empress ritual step by step together. Um, that's the best way to really, you know, rather than sort of thinking about it, seeing it and thinking about it, actually doing the hands on going through the motions is what's going to help you um, develop this skill set so that again, you have it for time to come. So of course, uh, gua sha comes from ancient Chinese medicine. It's been practiced for a very, very long time, initially on the body much more than on the face. There isn't so much documentation about it being adapted to the face on the body. It's much more vigorous and therapeutic. On the face, we're using it primarily more for beauty purposes, which is possibly why there's no documentation in these like more medical style texts that were primarily being made by men. So on the face, we are moving lymph, we are moving blood, we are releasing stagnation and tension. And again, all of these things help to nourish the vitality of your skin. We see typically a firming, a glow, a lifting over time, um, a clearing of hormonal breakouts. So what my clients and myself have both experienced is with regular facial gua sha, I'll still get like a monthly hormonal breakout, but it's going to be much smaller, heal much faster, and just be like dialed way down from like a 10 to a 2 because we are through the lymphatic system clearing stagnation on a regular basis. Um, your skin can just recover so much faster. So I also want to go over some contraindications. This part is a little bit boring, but bear with me because it's really important in case there is something um, that will make gua sha potentially um, not suitable for an area of your face. So contraindications include uh, recent Botox injections or other injectables, and you simply want to work around the areas that have been injected and not work over them. Um, once the injection starts to wear off, you can work over it. Um, some folks say that it's fine to work over a Botox injection after a few weeks, um, but it does make the Botox wear off faster because we are stimulating that drainage and the sort of metabolic process that's happening in general. So for that reason, most people that have injections want to keep them. So I just suggest uh, waiting until it's worn off completely. Any kind of skin inflammation, so think uh, sunburn, red rash, inflamed breakout, anything that causes your skin to be red or sensitive is going to be inflammation. Um, and you either want to work around it. So if you have like a breakout or two, you can absolutely just skip over them, work around them. Um, if you have like a sunburn, you're going to want to lay off your facial gua sha until that has resolved itself and healed. Um, and the other thing is overuse of things that thin the skin. So think like prescription retinols, anything that's gonna really like make the thin skin thin and sensitive, the skin is not gonna have a barrier in place and it's gonna be kind of cranky if we are doing this gliding over it. Healthy skin with a healthy skin barrier is totally fine with it. It's gonna benefit from it. But if the barrier is thinned, it's going to not like that very much. Let me think what else. Pregnancy, gua sha is great during pregnancy. There's one pressure point that you want to avoid at the tops of the shoulders, right where your bra strap would go. And I recommend more gentle pressure in general overall for pregnant folks. And I think that's about it. If you have like raised moles, 
Um, you just want to work around those so you're not dragging the tool over it, you know, very intuitive, common sense. And if you are more sensitive, you want to go easier, like just like less strokes, less pressure. And you can always work up over time. If you know you're very gentle and just do a few repetitions, you notice that's fine. You can maybe do a few more repetitions and see how that goes. Um, and that's, that's about it for the contraindications. So as you can see, it's good for just about everyone. There's just a few instances where we don't want to be um, stimulating the skin. Okay. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So let's see, where should we start? There's a few key factors that are going to kind of make your practice more or less effective. The direction that we go in, the angle that we use, the pressure that we use, and then getting a gentle little pull or tug on the skin. We're gonna practice on our forearms before we go into working on the neck and face. So first direction. On the neck, we're sort of breaking the neck up into the vertical segments. So we're working in these directions, um, primarily going up the side front panel from like outer jawbone and ear down to collarbone is a major lymphatic drainage highway. So here it can be really nice to go down if that is something that you wanna focus on um, for depuffing and complexion clearing. Otherwise you can just go upwards. Once we get onto the face, we're really just dividing it into planes going outward. And then we can go up on the forehead again. We vary our pressure depending on the area that we're in. So again, it's all very intuitive. The back of the neck and tops of the shoulders, those are like tense muscles a lot of the time. And that's some pretty like thick, resilient skin we have on the back there, right? So we can actually use some more pressure on the back of the neck and tops of the shoulders. That's gonna help to release the muscles and improve circulation to and from the face because all of your circulation to the face has to come through the neck and all of the drainage out of the face has to also come through the neck. Muscular tension in the neck and shoulders can act like a traffic jam to that optimal circulation. So we never skip the neck, even though it might not seem like it's going to really affect the face, it does. And it's going to make all of your work on the face more effective. So it's really important. Um, for good results. Plus, in my experience working on clients for 17 years, just about everyone has some neck and shoulder tension that could be released. And after this last year, I won't even. Now, when we get onto the face, our pressure reduces uh, significantly on the front of the neck as well, right? Because this is more delicate. Like you don't want to use pressure on the front of the neck. This is really, really delicate. Also the lymph where we're draining is gonna to respond to a lighter touch. So we get much lighter once we come around to the front of the neck. And when we're on the back, our angle really doesn't matter so much. We, it's again, very intuitive, pretty medium throughout the cheeks and jaw. And then we can get much lighter when we come to the eye area and treat that delicate area with a lot of sensitivity and gentleness. So get your oil. Oh, I forgot to tell you that in the beginning. I hope you've all got some oil handy to reapply to your face as needed. But first, we're going to do just a couple of drops on your forearm because we're going to practice our technique there before we get on to the face. And seeing do, 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 hyper versus hypothyroid, totally fine. I have a hypothyroid and have asked um, practitioners from um, acupuncturists to endocrinologists and they say that it's fine. Um, can you use the Aura Stone on the face? 
technically yes, but it's not going to fit very well. It's a little bit more large and clunky on the face. It's really made more for the larger planes of the body, whereas the Empress Stone, um, we took over a year designing this exact shape to hug every contour of the face. So for the Empress Stone, we have the U edge, this little U curve. We have the comb edge with those little teeth. We have this long curved edge and then we have this little short edge here. So the U edge hugs the contours, the bony contours of the face like the jaw, cheekbone, brow bone. Great for coming up the throat and spine as well. The comb edge is usually my default for most of the, the rest of the face and the flat planes that we're working on. That comb edge is just gonna offer a little bit more stimulation. If you're sensitive and you want less stimulation, you might wanna go with this long curved edge as your sort of default instead. This short little one fits right in for the under eye. Fits in really nicely for that area. Lines up next to the nose. And then we have the pointed tip. So now that we've got all of our forearms lubed up, you're gonna want to practice just gliding along and see what it feels like to go sort of more uh, at a 90 degree angle versus this 15 degree angle where I just have enough room for my, I've got my thumb right here and I want a lot of the surface area in contact with my skin. And that's where the magic is. You can feel that sort of sense of pull is really different than having it straight. I'm getting a lot more surface area in contact with this magical stone, the Beyond Stone that contains over 40 trace minerals and has been used for healing in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. This is a really, really beautiful stone. Um, and that's gonna have benefits for your skin as well as this gentle pull that's happening with that angle, benefiting the lymphatic drainage. So that's like the deep puffing and the fascia for firming and releasing. So you're just going to get a lot more out of it um, when you use that flat angle. Again, um, the back of the neck and tops of the shoulders, it's just kind of awkward to get around there. And what's more about the muscle release rather than those more subtle um, aspects. So the, the angle is just whatever you can get back there. Now, practice using some more pressure. So not on like the wrist where it's delicate, but like the belly of the forearm. Imagine you've been carrying heavy grocery bags or a suitcase, something that's going to create some tension there on the belly of the muscle and you want to release it. So you can actually apply pressure to the stone and give that a little massage. So that's the type of pressure that we can use on the back of the neck, tops of the shoulders to release those muscles. Next, just simply lay the stone pretty flat. Don't add any pressure at all. And just pull it along. Soothing, gentle pressure. In fact, you're not adding any pressure. It's just the weight of the stone. That's what we're going to use for delicate areas like the under eye, the side front of the neck here where um, we're doing some more lymph drainage. And then somewhere in between those two is where you're going to find your medium. So it's most likely pretty close to this light pressure and you're just pushing down a little bit. And that's what we're gonna be using again on areas like the cheeks, for example. So I think that is most of that on the technique and we can actually just get into it and experience it. If you need to reapply product, I know I do. And we do have um, a discount 
on the um, Empress tonic and oil for the 24 hours after this class, you get 20% off using the code fresh start all caps for the new year. And we did design these specifically for facial gua sha. When I started teaching workshops um, years ago, people were always asking, you know, what oil is best to use? What oil is going to be the most beneficial to use for facial gua sha? I'm seeing a message that the sound went away. I'm not muted. Can everyone else still hear me? Otherwise, uh, Laura, it might be on your end. I'm getting thumbs up. Okay, great. So yes, we designed these specifically to enhance all of the benefits of facial gua sha. So all of the ingredients are really mindfully sourced from their function to um, you know, where we actually get them from. We work with small farms um, and practice old school herbal methods of whole plant infusion. And I feel like we don't talk about how amazing our products are enough, but there's so much that goes into them. And we really, we really go the extra mile to make sure that it is sustainable, environmentally friendly, great for your skin. You know, we don't use any essential oils, it's whole plant infusions and all of the ingredients in there, again, help to further stimulate flow of lymph with the sweet fern and the tonic um, and circulation and warming to the skin with the balm of Gilead and resin complex in the Empress oil. Okay, so as I said, we start with the neck and we're gonna start on the back of the neck. The number of strokes that we repeat, repeat per area um, is going to be between three and 10. Three kind of being the minimum to get any kind of effect and 10 being where most people max out of like, okay, this has been enough stimulation to my skin. If you have sensitive skin, you're gonna wanna dial that down. If your skin is not sensitive and you have an area that you're working more over time as you get into this, you might be able to go over that without any kind of negative effects. And we would just see, you know, potentially like um, a little bit of redness or irritation if you overworked an area. Just like if you, you know, massaged any spot of your skin for too long, it might just get a little bit cranky about that. So we're going to do, let's do a five stroke ritual tonight. And what we do is we start with one side and we do that side completely. And then we go to the second side. So I'm going to turn around so you can see, we're gonna use this U edge to travel up the spine five times. And again, you can apply some pressure if that feels good. If anything ever doesn't feel good, modify it so it does for you, use less pressure, tweak it. And the pressure really goes on these two points. So it's not over the spine itself. Alrighty, let's get started.
we're going to continue coming around. Five strokes, a little bit lighter on the side of the neck here. And when you get to the end of the stroke, you can often do a little shimmy. So here, once you get to the hairline, maybe even just like a little up into it, it can feel nice to sort of press and wiggle. There's some really tight muscles and like a lot of stagnation that likes to accumulate back there. Next, we're gonna be doing this side front panel, again, from outer jaw, sort of ear lobe down to collarbone. There's a point along the collarbone called terminus. This is a major lymphatic drainage point. So we're bringing everything from the face down to this dump where it can then continue to flow through the body to be processed. So light pressure now, coming down. And let's do a nice little wiggle once we get to the collarbone further stimulating that point. Great, so now we're gonna use the U edge to come up the throat with feather, feather light pressure. We don't wanna be putting any pressure on the throat. It's really more of an energetic stroke. This is a major channel in Chinese medicine, so it's nice to bring it up that channel. It can also have a gentle lifting effect on the neck. All right, so that is the first side of the neck done. Does anybody else feel like they've arrived a little bit more in their body now? Yeah. Okay, so before we go into the face, let's just take this opportunity to like sink in a little bit deeper. We're gonna take three slow, deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. Softening your belly, filling all the way to the top on the inhale. Letting go on the exhale. <sighs> One more. Okay, so coming up to the face now, we're gonna use the U edge along the jaw, coming out to the ear. Take out my AirPod for that one. I really don't like using these things, but it does help you to hear me a little bit better for this. Pressure is medium, and I like to get the elbow up a bit. And I like to work on the same side. So it might mean that one hand has to learn some new tricks, but it will save you in the long run. It will cause some discomfort and also not get the same level of results 
here using the other hand on the opposite side. Remember your angle, getting some nice contact with the skin. Sometimes it becomes a little bit straighter towards the edge of the face, that's fine. And a nice little wiggle here as well to further promote the release of muscular tension and stimulate lymphatic points there as well. Do one more for good luck. Okay, so next we're going to come on to the cheek, but first find your cheekbone. Just palpate where your cheekbone is. So we're going to stay below the cheekbone for this stroke. This allows us to get into the fleshy bit of the cheek with a little bit more oomph without going over the bone. And here we're bringing in a new um, technique, a new little assist. The opposite hand is going to help anchor the skin so we're not over pulling. And that's also going to help have a nice firming effect. So with this stroke, you can either start at the center of the chin or right next to the mouth. And then once we get to about this point, this hand helps secure the skin. And we get to the ear, a nice little shimmy as well, just to again, further stimulate the lymph and muscular release. A lot of the time I'll see folks on Instagram sort of holding at the chin while they do this, but you can feel that's not actually affecting the skin of the cheek, which is what we want to secure in place from moving too much. Now I've lost count. This is the danger of doing and teaching at the same time is that at some point I just get really relaxed and spaced out. Okay, next we're going to come back to the U edge and we're gonna do the cheekbone now, just contouring the cheekbone from nose all the way out to the hairline. And you can also do a little like, wiggle there if you want. You totally don't have to. Shimmy is optional. It can feel really nice. And again, just stimulate and enhance benefits a bit. See any question there? Pressure, pressure for the shimmy. Um, whatever feels good. All right, coming up to the under eye now. This is really delicate. This is the thinnest skin on the face other than the lips. So we wanna make sure that we are not over pulling, over tugging. Um, doing anything to the skin that's going to negatively impact it. So that's where we bring in our really light pressure. It's just making contact with the stone and then gliding out. And we also wanna come in with the opposite hand and use more just a finger or two to secure that skin so it's not being over pulled as we glide along. It's a really gentle um, little caress for the under eye. So this short edge lines up with the nose and we glide out so gently. You wanna leave a little space below your lash line because we don't ever wanna be getting product in the eye itself. Continuing to breathe. And try 
Closing your eyes if you feel like once you've got the stroke in place and tuning into the sensation. Beautiful. Okay, finishing up the under eye, coming to the next stroke. The U edge is going to hug along the brow bone. Now the bottom of that stroke, right, is going to sort of affect the upper eyelid. Actually, I'm gonna get just a little oil right below my brow and make sure that area has some slip as well. Depending on your face shape, some folks have really high eyebrows. Um, my eye area is really tiny, so I am getting on the upper eyelid area there a bit more. We never want to, you know, be on the eyeball or itself, staying above that and being aware with the stroke as well that we want to be gentle and not over pull that upper lid because it's also very delicate. And then we just start at the center and lightly glide out. I like to bring those fingers there as well again so that I'm not stretching my delicate lid. It's one of the most common questions I'll see in comments on Instagram from people that are brand new to this and they're like, wait, isn't pulling the skin going to be bad for it? As you can see, we're really gentle with areas that could potentially be negatively impacted by over pulling and we're really just benefiting the skin by bringing all of that circulation and vitality to it, um, which helps all of the functions of the skin, including collagen production. All right, now we're gonna come onto the forehead and we're gonna go vertical again. So I'm just gonna start right above the eyebrow and glide straight up to the hairline. And here I'm abandoning my support hand because I actually want this to lift a little bit. Now, if you have more uh, horizontal lines across the forehead and more tension there, you can actually bring in that support hand and create a little bit of a stretch to release that bunched tissue more. And then coming to center, my favorite stroke of the whole darn ritual, starting below the eyebrows in the center over the third eye, gliding straight up to the hairline. Our pressure here is light to medium. Areas where we have more just kind of skin and then bone are going to be more prone to redness. Areas that are more fleshy like the cheek can use a little bit more pressure without consequence. And so we want to just be mindful. releasing worry. Often our emotions live in our tissues, especially because our facial expressions are each associated with an emotion. All right, so we have completed side one. Um, Linda's asking, does this affect Botox? Yes, it does. We went over that in the contraindications. Um, so you can watch the beginning of the video. Again, this is being recorded and we're gonna post that. If there's a little bit of redness coming up, so traditionally on the body, when it's done really vigorously, it does cause redness and that's the goal is to release the stagnation and have um, this shock come up, this redness. On the face, we don't really want to do that. Um, temporary pinking is totally normal for certain skin types and then it typically goes down and that's fine. Just a little increase in circulation. And for people that are prone to like rosacea redness, you would of course just go really, really lightly. And if there is like a rosacea flare, skip the cheek stroke, just go straight from the lower cheek then to the under eye. 
um, but otherwise it's fine as well. You just want to use, as I said in the beginning, less pressure for sensitive skin. Um, but a little bit of redness that sticks around if you, for example, here, um, if you're kind of going at it a bit too hard, if you get a bit of redness that sticks around for a few days, that is a little bit of shot, a little bit of stagnation coming up and an indication to you to dial down your pressure. You don't want to see any white knuckles gripping the stone. It should all feel really good. It can feel awkward at first to hold the stone as well, but you'll find ways where it feels like um, more comfortable and it will become an extension of your hand in time. So let's just take a moment to check in with what's shifted from one side of the face to the other. Notice how your face feels under your fingertips. The side that we work definitely feels um, more firm and less puffy. The other side feels a little bit more like a marshmallow for me in comparison. And also sense how your face feels from the inside out. So without even touching it, does one side feel different than the other? For me, the side that we work just feels much more alive and um, animated, whereas again, this sort of like puffiness, I feel present on the side that we haven't yet worked. Wonderful. Let's get, oh, let's have some water first and then we'll get started with side two. Um, really great to drink water um, after doing facial gua sha. Uh, sometimes people will get a bit of a headache or a little achy after doing facial gua sha. Most of the time, all you need is more hydration because we are getting things moving and you want to flush it through the body. So always have a nice big glass of water. All right, so the second side, we're not gonna repeat the center strokes. So we're gonna start right next to the spine, back of the neck, comb edge, or the other one if you prefer that, coming from the base of the neck up to the hairline. Pressure can be firm if that feels good. It sure does for me. Okay, coming around the neck now, sort of the side here, using some less pressure, a little bit less pressure here as it gets more delicate. Okay, finishing up with that one, coming around for the drainage stroke on the side front of the neck. Light pressure, nice, almost flat stone gliding down to the collarbone. And a little shimmy here. And that shimmy is um, on the lighter side, because we keep it light for lymph stimulation in general, that's such a major lymph point. The other areas on the face where we do the little shimmy, we're also getting into muscles. So sometimes it can feel good to use more pressure, but this is purely lymph. And if you wanted to only focus on lifting on the neck, you would just reverse this stroke so that you are coming up rather than going down, but just about everyone needs some lymph drainage. Okay, next we're gonna come up to the jaw with the U edge. 
pressure is medium-ish. Again, this is going to vary. It's a little bit of a, a dimmer switch depending on skin sensitivity and jaw tension for resilient, unsensitive skin and a tight jaw. It might feel really good to use some more pressure. Sensitive or reactive skin types, you want to keep it less, especially as you're getting started. And then you'll start to get to know your own skin better in relationship to facial gua sha. Okay, next, remember again, staying below the cheekbone now so we can get into the fleshy bit of the cheek a little bit more. Starting either at the center of the chin or next to the mouth and then anchoring, coming up to the ear. Continuing to breathe. And again, I welcome close of the eyes once you've got your stroke in place, if that feels good to you. This is a treatment that is deeper than skin deep. We are getting into relaxation mode, affecting the parasympathetic nervous system. We're coming home to our bodies. And finishing up there. Now coming along the cheekbone with the U edge from nose up to temple. And this is a nice one if you've got sinus pressure as well. You can sort of open up here a little bit before you get to that stroke, just right next to the nostril. It's a pressure point in Chinese medicine called welcome fragrance. Okay, under eye, short edge lines up with the nose, very light pressure, and using your opposite hand to lightly anchor that skin and prevent any overstretching. For some reason, I find this so soothing. Okay. Next, U edge brow bone. Remember, we're keeping it pretty light for that upper lid as well. Continuing to breathe, tuning into the sensations. And then above the eyebrow, up to the hairline. Again, you could bring in the other hand if you wanted to create a little bit 
of a stretch in that tissue, opening up a forehead that likes to sort of contract. Or you can just do a little lift. <sighs> and then because I love this one so much, we'll just finish off with a few more over the third eye. This is a very soothing stroke to the nervous system. The third eye point is a pressure point in many ancient traditions. This stroke is great for, um, again, calming as well as insomnia. And we are complete. So you can set your stone down, have another drink of water. And I will get to the chat box. So if there's a flood of questions, I can't promise that I will get to all of them, but I will get to a lot here. So Cammie's asking, is Retin-A always a contraindication? I have thick skin and I've never had a reaction. So what I said was a contraindication is overuse of uh, prescription retinols that cause skin thinning. So if your skin is thinned by it, um, if you're just using it once in a while, your skin's resilient, good to go, no problem. Okay, Kelly's asking, the jaw is the only place I notice bumpiness. Is that all muscle tension? So the jawbone itself is not a smooth bone. It has natural ridges, but then there are also muscles that are going to attach down by the jawbone that can be kind of ropey and there can be adhesions there. So it can be one or the other. Raquel, I'm a little nervous of using the oil on my face. Could it cause acne? So oil does not cause acne. Bacteria does, and usually an imbalance in the microbiome in our skin. We all have bacteria on our skin that is beneficial. We all have bacteria in our gut that is beneficial, and they are intricately linked. Um, oil, again, does not cause acne. Um, we want to use the right oils for our skin type, um, and the Empress oil is actually quite light and there are antibacterial ingredients in there like the balm of Gilead. So most folks find that it's totally fine if not beneficial for breakout prone skin. Um, and the, that oil is just really great, the Empress oil, because it has the right sort of viscosity for facial gua sha. Um, using something like a water-based gel, uh, if that's some kind of a moisturizer that you're using, isn't really suitable for facial gua sha because it absorbs very quickly and you're not going to have continuous slip and glide. Norm's asking, what stroke would you recommend for forehead 11s between the eyes? So I'm not going to get into all the specifics because I know everyone has um, areas that they really want to focus in on. So what we've gone over today is the foundation, the Empress Ritual. And then all of our tutorials on Instagram um, that I do and that other folks contribute to as well focus in on specific areas and get a little bit more particular into the nitty gritty of how we can treat different things. And you typically want to be integrating this into a full ritual. So for example, this last week I posted um, a tutorial on the 11 lines. So you can go back and check that out, Norma. And what you would want to do is go through your ritual and then when you're on the forehead part, integrate um, what I showed in the tutorial to additionally open up through this area. And then the one thing we haven't gone over, a little bit more advanced, is using the comb edge for friction. So this is cross friction. Typically, uh, a line or a wrinkle starts to act like scar tissue. You can actually feel it in your skin. Um, so if you go over, if you have, for example, an 11 line and you go over lightly and you're sort of sensing what's going on, I can feel a ridge, like a, a little valley that happens as the stone goes over that area. So bringing in cross friction starts to break up the fascia that is getting stuck 
in that pattern. So that's when we bring in very, very, very light, like a pencil eraser, because if you go hard with this, you're going to bring up redness and it's going to stick around for at least a few days. So we go really light with this technique. Go back and forth like a little pencil eraser. And imagine that it's a pencil eraser that you're using on very thin paper and you don't want to tear the paper and you go across the line um, with that cross friction and there's lots of different tutorials that we have showing uh, using this on different lines from 11s to crow's feet, um, smile lines, etc. So those are all on the Wildling Instagram. Erin, do you wash the stone after each use? Yeah, so you can just wash it with soap and water. Um, the stone will break if you drop it like on a tile floor or even um, potentially in the sink. Any thin slice of natural stone will break if you drop it or can, has potential to break if you drop it. So it's not particular to wildling, it's not particular to beyond stone any type of thin natural stone um, can break. And actually in my practice in New York, we went through, we had multiple practitioners doing like five treatments a day and never broke an empress stone. We did break some amethyst and rose quartz, but um, be careful. And when you wash it, it can get slippy. That's why I say that, um, but just soap and water and then drying it. And if you wanna use anything like, uh, an organic hand sanitizer for a little bit of alcohol on there, something like that, and store it in a safe place. All right, it looks like most of the questions are about specific areas. Again, if it's like uh, an area you want to focus on, just look through our Instagram for if it's crow's feet, crow's feet, if it's TMJ, TMJ. Great question. How often should we do this and best time of day? So we see, to start to see benefits around three times a week. And this is, you know, a holistic way of working with the tissue and with the face, right? So we actually, we have immediate benefits. Um, I can tell in my skin and definitely let me know if you notice anything happening in your skin, especially when we got to that halfway point. I just think that's really interesting. Um, but we start to see these immediate results. And then as we do it with repetition, it starts to become a cumulative shift. Just like if you started a yoga practice, you might feel good after your first practice. Over time, you're going to gain flexibility, you're going to gain strength, you're going to start repatterning the body. Similar with facial gua sha, we're going to start repatterning um, how our face is actually going to age over time because we are releasing stagnation, we are releasing tension, which means that um, for example, like little furrows, I know for a fact, especially going through the last five years I've been through, if I wasn't doing facial gua sha, they would be a whole lot deeper. I still have little ridges that I can feel, um, but again, I know they'd be a lot deeper if I wasn't doing this to release on a regular basis. Same things with, with jaw tension. Again, a lot of jaw tension. I'm releasing that on a regular basis and so it doesn't build up and cause the same types of problems like headaches and stagnation in the tissue. A question about using the stone to help soften a facial scar if it is completely healed, if the scar is completely healed and you do not keloid, um, you can use that same gentle pencil eraser technique over it. If you want to do lymph drainage and lifting, can you do both in the same session? Yes, you can. And the way I would do that is to do the drainage stroke in the beginning, go through the whole thing, and then come back at the end and do your lifting so that that drainage can happen throughout the, the remainder of the session. And then you lift at the end. Uh, Naomi, do you wash your face after you finish the ritual? Um, no, you can just work your products in unless you really, um, your skin does much better with less on it. Again, um, oils don't cause acne, but different skin types will like different levels of moisture. Right now in the Northern Hemisphere, we're in winter, it's pretty dry most places, skin likes a lot. If you want less for your skin, you could remove it, but typically you're gonna be using things that can really soak in um, and even then layer on top of that if you have further products you wanna apply.
Um, do you drain the face after as well or just in the beginning? So this is again, um, the Empress ritual is our foundation, right? So this is just where we start. If you have um, a reason that you really wanna focus on drainage, uh, I did a tutorial recently where we're actually coming down this stroke every couple of strokes on the face. So you can look that up as well. Can you drain your lymph nodes? Oh, using this on your armpits. Yeah, so we do have axillary nodes here as well, but actually the entire face, head and neck is going to drain to these points specifically. This is where they drain to um, and re-enter into the body. So the armpits, you're gonna be affecting more the breast area, the back is gonna to drain to, the, the upper back is gonna to drain to that area. Okay, morning or evening, whenever you have time. Um, I really like to do at the end of the day because I feel like I'm making more facial expressions during the day, um, whether I'm in meetings or talking to people and it feels really good to sort of take the day off on a deeper level after washing my face and release that tension before I go to sleep and go to sleep with a more relaxed face. Um, and I also find this really effective, actually, if you are working on something like uh, 11s or um, the jaw muscle. We didn't get into the wand at all, but for TMJ, this is really the preferred tool, the wand. And we really get into deeper muscular tension with this stone. So um, for the sort of tension that accumulates through stress and worry, I really like to release before bedtime for a better sleep, a more relaxed sleep, um, and allowing the face to sort of stay in that state while I'm in bed. But morning can be amazing too if you want to get a little bit more vibrancy going for your day. Whenever you have time is really the best. Mary's asking, is the body gua sha aura oil and empress oil the same? No, not at all. They're formulated for very, very different purposes. Um, so do, do not use the aura oil on your face. It's specifically for the body. Diana says, I definitely feel and see a difference in the puffiness and firmness in my skin. Amazing, lots of thank yous. Laura says, I was noticed in the next morning, my eyes aren't puffy. That just woke up like, yeah, that's the other reason that I really like to do at night because I still notice the benefits the next morning when I wake up. Um, like I'll, I'm chronically puffy, so don't judge my, my puffiness on the efficacy of gua sha. Um, I have chronic illness and I'm just like, I'm a little puff monster and gua sha helps to keep it under control um, and kind of dial down like the level of puffiness. Believe me, I'd just be like out to here if it wasn't for facial gua sha, but I'm just always gonna be a little puffy. I have been since I was a kid. My friends used to make fun of me for my puffy eyes when I was like nine years old. Okay, the promo is for certain products only. Yes, so it's 20% off the Empress Oil and tonic with code fresh start for the next 24 hours only. Um, so it's only those products, only for the next 24 hours. Oh, this is a great one. Um, does gua sha minimize dark eye circles? So yes and. Um, so you're getting the circulation going and I can, I have seen um, in folks that I've worked on as clients, as well as people that have reported back to me, there can be a significant reduction because that is blood stagnation pooling under the area. But you also want to make sure that it's not uh, like a long-term internal issue. For example, I was just saying like, oh, I'm chronically puffy. I'm going to kind of always have puffy eyes, um, at least a little bit, because it's a deep internal inflammation. Um, if there is an internal issue causing those dark circles, if there's insomnia, if you're not resting, if you're going, like, if you've been going, 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 um, or if there's anemia present. So, uh, easy bruising and dark circles under the eyes can be a sign of anemia. So that can be something that you check out with your doctor if you do bruise really easily and you have dark circles. Um, sometimes iron supplementation can help tremendously with that. 
and then also again getting that circulation moving. There can also be like darker pigmented skin versus like darker circles under the eyes and I've seen it be beneficial for both. Often there's a genetic factor with the sort of darker skin, often it will be hereditary and you'll see that your mother or father will have the same thing as well. Okay, can you do Kwa Sha seven days a week? Can you overdo it? You can overdo it. So I recommend only once a day, not twice a day. You can do it um, seven days a week, but I would say once a month, just take like two to three days off. Um, just like let your skin integrate and relax, just like you might do with an exercise regimen as well. And again, this might vary based on sensitivity. So someone who's really sensitive might want to do less um, and then build up but for most folks, every day is awesome. Is there a planned wand tutorial similar to this anytime soon? You know, I just did one a couple of weeks ago and I'm pretty sure we saved it. Um, and it was really relaxing and awesome. We all got together on Zoom just like this. So Jen, you can look for that. All right, so we are after six now, and I think I got to a lot of questions. I don't want to take up more of your evening, or it's six o'clock for me. I have no idea what time, I don't know where everyone is. It's probably a different time where everyone is. That's the kind of the beauty of this, and get to connect with people all over the country and all over the world. Um, so thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that you've learned um, some skills and techniques that again, you can literally take with you into the rest of your life. And um, my hope is that we also share this with the future generations, this way of taking care of our faces, our beauty, ourselves, that is sustainable, self-loving, non-toxic, um, all of the things. So thank you so much. And again, check out all of our sort of specialized tutorials if there's an area that you wanna focus in on and you've already made great steps towards creating a great foundation for all of the other specialized tutorials you wanna bring in. All right, everyone, lots of love to you. Remember to drink water.